photograph I took in Germany. And I've previously done a lot of drawings on photographs using paint, but in this case, I've been using metallic tape. It's a kind of industrial tape that is used for uh, binding up pipes for air vents. But in this case, uh, it has a very strong metallic presence and a very literal quality. The material uh, intervenes in the way that you read the photograph, so it's a little bit of an abrupt uh, contrast to the photograph. So this is part of what I'm interested in. Uh, also, eliminating part of part of the photograph, so you're left with only a partial view of the photograph, uh, which in, in a certain way is a reference to how photography itself is not really a complete view of anything or a complete picture of anything. It's sometimes we like to believe that a photograph somehow can tell the whole story about something, but in, but in its own way, photograph of course is only a moment in time. So this is, this is sort of another level on top of that, this idea of um, obscuring part of the photograph. It's why uh, Peter Bloom jokingly uh, calls this my Zen, my Zen piece, because I think he he's sort of uh, having some understanding of that idea that it, that it's going beyond the literal. So yeah, this one uh, yeah, it's a very calming, it's a very calm piece in a way. This one. I This room has a very different quality. It's a little bit of a side room from the gallery, and Peter decided to keep to keep it a little more raw. It used to be part of the storage space for the gallery, but now it's a little exhibition room. So it has the wood floor and the brick wall behind you, which is quite quite nice. I think it works well uh, for my work. It has a little bit of a raw industrial. Uh, feeling a little bit of the old New York and uh, so this room also recent recent sculpture just the last uh, half year the end of 2006 into 2000 sorry 2010 to 2011 oh, five year time lapse there um, but this is actually a piece that I, I consider a bit of a tribute to Giacometti. Uh, I call the piece 20th Century King. Uh, he, he's one of several kings from the 20th century, but I think very deserving. And uh, I didn't set out to make it a Giacometti tribute, but somehow the form, this, this sort of vertical form that, that developed and these, uh, these sacks of plaster, I initially had this as a literal ballast for the piece before I set it in this concrete filled bucket. So 
the plaster was initially going to hold the piece up in a way to support the weight at the bottom, to support the vertical, but it, it began to seem too obvious to me during making the piece, so I ended up cutting, cutting this part off the bottom of this part and turning it upside down, and it actually became more, more of a, a painting, if you will, a kind of presented uh, three-dimensional painting or uh, somehow also a reference to furniture. And then I found a way to support the, the tower part of the piece just thrust into this bucket of, of concrete. So it, it went from being a single object to actually being a, a two-part sculpture, but it's the same, the same piece, one, one work. These are work gloves from my studio that I actually use use when I'm making things and I, I've done a lot of works with gloves. I think it's, I like the variety of materials that you can get. Uh, gloves come in these, these um, different rubber materials and also cloth and there's a lot of different texture already in the gloves. But then when they get the inclusion of the paint and in this case I actually glued them with a black corking into this tub. They they merge more or less into being being one one form, one sort of mass of these gloves that lose their autonomy. Again, it reads for me as as a painting, in a sense, this this three dimensional painting. Uh, you could see it as a combination of, uh, and, and I, I say this with a pinch of salt, but um, a combination of uh, uh, Chamberlain meets de Kooning or something. I'd like to imagine it would be uh, somewhat interesting in, in relation to their work. Paint, dried paint pieces out of my mixing buckets and I, I pull them free of the plastic containers and then try and uh, merge them into somehow a, their, their, new, their new thing. They somehow can blend almost like a, a painter's palette. And often there's a little bit of wet paint in amongst, so it tends to adhere it together almost like a, a glue. The paint acts as a little bit of a glue within this case, so it it actually um, creates this new form out of these shards of old paint. This one, the the case, the the plexiglass case, actually is a container that provides the the parameters of the piece in that it it. It can't, uh, this flow of paint was just held to that limit by the container, so it's a little bit of this tension between, between a, an organic form and then a, a rigid form and, and the way the two interact. So it's actually a, an, an actual frame for, for the wet paint. into the single simple form. So actually it, it was cut up and re-glued a number of times and you can see that the scenes where that happened. I, I also uh, had wheels on different sides of it, but in the end I just took all the wheels off except for on the bottom. And if you actually go down and look underneath, you'll be able to see that there's uh, there's a, a huge cluster of wheels that are not really serving a purpose. They're not, they're not particularly functional. They're more just somehow this accumulation, a little bit like you might find on the bottom of a boat with, with little barnacle shells or something like that. There's this kind of growth. It's almost like a growth of wheels.
So this was a, a book project with Edward Albee, the, the American playwright. And I did this series of drawings on photographs and Edward made these comments that we used, we printed them in his own handwriting. So he wrote immediate responses to drawings and uh, Peter Bloom published this book. So uh, it's something I'm very, very proud of, in fact. It's a, it's a wonderful thing to have been able to work on. And actually, we, we offered uh, Edward various pens to write with, and he chose the biggest one that we had. He wanted the writing to be really in a big scale like this, which I think looks, looks wonderful in conjunction with the drawings. The drawings are all on photographs, although in some cases there's not a lot of evidence of the photograph, just this little slice of the photograph here. This one's actually a, an image of two images of the same sculpture in the to Toronto, the Ontario Museum of Art. It's actually a uh, Eskimo sculpture. This is uh, photos of the front of an air conditioner where people have come along and pressed their fingers into it, creating this found drawing. So I photographed a lot of these over the years and we included this one in the, in the book here. And of course, some more dumpster type imagery here. This, this dumpster actually had tape on it, uh, but it's interesting that it functions in a little bit of the same manner and the way the big silver drawings we were just looking at function. But in this case, they're actually on the, in the photograph. This was a smashed sign in Detroit and uh, Detroit has been through hard times in the last few decades. So there's a lot of interesting rundown urban settings and architecture there. This is one of my favorite of Edward's statements, the blue absence. So here it is on this wonderful paper. It's, it's nice to open it up again. Edward chose the title for the book, Obscure Reveal. And in fact, this is again his own handwriting and Edward chose the color for the cover. We had, Peter and I had had a, a paler orange as a possibility and Edward immediately pointed to the most vivid orange color and we said, yes, this is, this is in fact the right choice. <laughs> 